um, Jesus Christ, this is basically the theme uh, that um, Jesus Christ has come in our flesh to bring about a new creation, both within us and in all of creation. Jesus Christ takes upon himself our frail and death-doomed humanity in order to make it new. He came to die for the sins of the world. This he has done and will yet make all things new as a result of his incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and exaltation. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. They mentioned that the word incarnation, the, the noun incarnation or adjective incarnate is not found in the Bible, but we have the Greek in sarki, which translated into the Latin is encarne, which is where we get our word incarnation. And certainly a lot of scriptural support for that as well, like 1 Timothy 3.16 that says he or God was manifested in the flesh. In 1 John, his, um, in his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 2 says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He was correcting a, the, um, a heresy at the time called docetism. And in second, his second letter, verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver in the Antichrist. And then I had a quote from a Bible dictionary, if you remember that, and um, I'm not going to read the whole quote now, but basically saying that the biblical authors in the New Testament are not giving us, you know, philosophical kind of definitions of the incarnation or how it could possibly have happened. They just state it in salvific, for salvific purposes. They're stating it as fact that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh that we might be saved. I had mentioned before that um, reading that book by Joel Beakey, I'm on the chapter now where he's talking about John Calvin as a preacher. And I had known this before, but it was a nice, a nice refreshment that um, John Calvin would step up to the pulpit with his Greek New Testament and his Hebrew Old Testament and no notes. He always preached extemporaneously. And um, he just would open those up and translate as he went along and uh, he never wanted his, and he, he never wrote out any of his sermons. So what we have today over a couple, I think about 2,000 of his sermons were only because people, a, a particular individual sitting in the church was writing out his, his sermons, otherwise we wouldn't have any of his sermons remaining today. But just extemporaneously, and he said, because it's so important that we preach the word of God from the heart. And he would have to keep his sermons to 45 minutes, about 40, 45 minutes. Um, very uncommon at that time when people would come to hear the word of God, many of people of which didn't even have a Bible, so they really looked forward to getting a lot of scripture. When it came to the service on Sunday, most would preach for about an hour and a half, but because of his physical ailments, in particular his asthma, he had asthma really bad among so many other sicknesses, that he was a, a frail man physically, and it's unbelievable how much he's, he accomplished in, the, in his short lifetime. But he would have to keep his sermons to about 45 minutes, and so I'll try to keep mine at 45 minutes too. No, anyways. Praise God. I really appreciate, um, appreciate his, his ministry in a big way. We looked at Genesis chapter 1. We don't, you don't have to turn there today if you don't want to. Uh, and then we compared it to John chapter 1. We saw some comparisons um, in the creation narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth were without form and void. 
We see that we see darkness covering the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was brooding or hovering over the waters. This, the, the presence of the Spirit there and, and in this one particular Bible, the Rotherham translation in one of his notes, he explains the meaning of the Hebrew meaning of the word to brood or to hover. And it means to be pregnant with incipient life. The Holy Spirit comes powerfully over the waters with incipient life. And the word is spoken, light be, and then there is light. We see the work of the triune God in all of the creation. We see the Father speak, we see the word, and we see the Spirit of God at work in the creation. And we see it in the new creation as well. We'll see that today. We see um, the word beginning in 1 John as well as in Genesis 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was made flesh. She's, well, let me go backtrack here before I get to the word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. And there was nothing that was made but that was made through him. And it was life. And that life is the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not or did not overcome it. So we see beginning, we see light, we see darkness, we see creation, we see word, and we see life, both in the creation account and in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it'll be very significant for us. And then we see that the word had become flesh and dwelt among us. John says, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John said, I, I, John the apostles saying, I, I saw this man, truly flesh, truly man. And what we were seeing was his glory. We were seeing something fantastic. In his first epistle, he said, that which we have seen and heard, that which we looked at and we gazed upon and handled with our hands, we touched him, this one who is the word of life. And um, John said he's very much real. We touched him, we saw him, we lived with him for three and a half years, gazed upon him. He's very much human very much a human being, and yet the glory of God itself. He calls him God, this one that I saw. That is, that is amazing. And um, it's amazing because he saw the humanity in such a real way, and yet he saw the glory of God displayed through him. John's gospel is fascinating to read in that respect. He's the one who recorded the words where Jesus said, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Praise God. Now what we're going to look at is a parallel, I believe, between what we've seen in the creation narrative and what we see at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. You'll go for just a moment to Mark's Gospel, Chapter 1. Mark's Gospel, Chapter 1. I've titled today's message, Rend the Heavens, O Lord, and Come Down. Rend the Heavens and Come Down. That is a quote from Isaiah the prophet, chapter 64, verse 1. Rend the heavens, O Lord, and come down. And what Isaiah the prophet, what Isaiah the prophet is, is crying out at that point is, Lord, that you would just tear apart the heavens that you would come down and make your glory clear to the people, that the people of Israel would repent and that the nations would see that you are God and you alone are Lord. His, it's a heart cry from the depth of his being. Rend the heavens, O Lord, and come down. It would be interesting to see what was in the heart of Isaiah or to see his emotion and his expression at the time as he's recording these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That became a, 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 um, a scripture for the Jewish people 
that they would use in their own prayers and cries for the coming of the Messiah. Lord, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down and vindicate your name, O Lord. Rend the heavens, come down, Lord, and reveal yourself in your glory and fulfill your purposes for us. I believe that Mark in his gospel picks up on that theme in the baptism of Jesus, chapter 1. Just a couple verses here, verses 9 to 11. It says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. We see Jesus coming to a baptism that he did not need, but he identified with the sinful people he had come to save by submitting to that baptism. John the Baptist says to him in Matthew's account, you're coming to me to be baptized? I need to be baptized by you, and yet you're coming to me. And Jesus said, let it be so now that we might fulfill all righteousness. Let it be that I would identify with the very people I've come to save. That's what the incarnation is really all about. Christ coming to take upon himself our humanity to identify fully with us. And what I see here is so interesting to see once again the presence of the word and the voice from heaven, the word in Christ and the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. We see the triune God here. And Jesus coming up out of the waters. Once again, if you could get the symbolism here, and I've heard, I've heard others preach on this subject, and it's fascinating. The waters, that's at the very beginning in Genesis, the earth was covered with the waters. And the Spirit of God comes to brood upon the waters, and then God speaks. Here we have Jesus coming up, the new Adam, the second Adam, the new man, to bring about the new humanity, coming up out of the water and the Spirit of God coming upon him and God speaking. It says in Mark's account, which is why I went to this particular one, that the heavens were torn open. One commentary I was reading, the author there said, that the allusion is here to the messianic hope of the Jewish people and to Isaiah 64, rend the heavens, O Lord, and come down. Symbolism is great. God has rent the heavens and he has literally come down in Christ in the incarnation. Not that he came down at that point moments to inhabit Christ like one of the heresies of the early church. No, Jesus Christ was, was God incarnate from the moment of his conception. And But here we see him anointed for his ministry, the Spirit of God coming upon Christ for his ministry. And we hear the voice of God, the beginning of something new, a new creation. God becoming flesh taking upon himself our humanity to identify with us. Think for a moment. How many times have you maybe felt the way Isaiah the prophet felt? Oh Lord, <laughs> rend the heavens and come down. God, maybe you never worded it like that, but you may have said, God, do something. <laughs> I'm, I'm desperate. The psalmist certainly cried out that way. The psalmist, and, and um, let me just read that for a moment in Psalm 42. I'm hoping that we can get to the pulse here. 
the very heart of the incarnation, to know it more than just a doctrine, just a teaching, but to be awed and stunned by it. Someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the one who took, who though in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a man. Coming in the fashion, in fashion as a man, he humbles himself as a servant, becoming obedient to the point of death. In Psalm 42, it says, as the deer, starting with verse 1, just a couple of verses here. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants or longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When, when the psalmist says that, when shall I come and appear before God, what he is saying is, I haven't known your presence. I've been distanced from your temple in Jerusalem, and I'm desperate for your presence. When shall I come again and appear before you? My soul thirsts for you, Lord. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. Uh, I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. I was a part of all the wonderful worship and celebration within Jerusalem where the presence of the Lord was. I was a part of that throng. I would lead them in procession with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Then the psalmist says, why? Are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Why are you agitated within me, disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He's desperate. And he's saying, I thirst for you. I hunger for the living God. Have you ever felt that way? I can remember, I can remember myself going into, when I first went into college and having come out of some really difficult times and some depression. And I, I remember thinking to myself, I want the living God. I want what's real. I, I, I don't want just, just a theology. I don't want just an idea. Just a creed, though, yeah, the, the creed's important, the theology's important, but, man, I, I, I don't want just a good feeling. I don't want just a devotional. I want the living God. And the psalmist is experiencing that. I hunger, I thirst for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? When shall I have that joy restored? I want, I want that which is real. And do you hear do you hear the psalmist crying out? Do you hear Isaiah crying out? Rend the heavens, O Lord, and come down. I want that which is true, which is real, which is life itself. Psalm 63, a very similar kind of cry. Just the first five verses. O God, starting with verse 1. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Have you ever felt that way? A dry and a weary land. God, I seek you earnestly. I'm desperate. Once again, I thirst. I hunger. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. By mentioning soul and flesh, he's saying with my whole being, I'm desperate for you. It's you, God, that I want. You see, only, only a relationship with the real, the true, and the living God can ever satisfy the heart. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, 
because your steadfast love is better than life. Your steadfast love, your covenant love and grace here, your loyal love is better than life. My lips will praise you. I know I will yet praise you. I know I will yet bless you. Like Psalm 42 said, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for you shall yet again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. See, the psalmist in both of these places, Psalm 63 and in Psalm 42, has both a longing, a desperation, a hunger, and yet at the same time, a faith that yes, I will yet praise the Lord, that God is faithful, that his loving kindness, his grace is much greater than life itself. So there are times when we're desperate, like Psalm 34 at the beginning, many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And then very next verse, not one of his bones is broken. Have you ever thought of that? Yeah, yeah, it, it looks forward to Christ. But have you ever thought of that? Not one of his bones shall be broken. When they crucified Jesus Christ, they had what looked like their own free will completely and how they beat him, right? I mean, they just beat him to their... I don't know if I could use the phrase heart's content or whatever, but they were malicious and vile. And yet in all the sufferings and in all the beatings, they did not break one of his bones. What was God communicating there? One of the things I believe he was communicating is that he himself was very much in control. God is the one who handed his son over, spared him not that we might be saved. This was all in the plan and in the counsels and in the purposes of God that Jesus Christ would go to the cross as the Lamb of God. God was in control. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, you by wicked hands, you took him and you crucified him, but it was according to God's purpose that he was even handed over to you. God is in control. But what I want us to see here is in the desperation that we would have, at times longing for God to just do something, the hunger and the thirst and the prayer of desperation that at times we feel and experience, knowing that our afflictions are many, but yet the Lord will deliver us out of them. But we need to have the same confidence that the psalmist had that God does fulfill his word. He fulfills his will, his promises, his purposes. In, um, for anybody who's familiar with the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, he has the um, one scene where giant despair imprisons Christian and hopeful. They had gone off the king's highway a little bit looking for an easier route, <laughs> and they end up being prisoners in a dark dungeon by giant despair. For those who um, have studied the life of John Bunyan and comment on what he's communicating there, he's most likely making reference to his own life. Some of the times that he spent 12 and a half years in prison altogether, and the people, the prison conditions were absolutely horrifying at that time, way before any kind of prison reform. Even back then, though, by the time you get into um, the beginning of the 18th century, there are those in England who are trying to do something about the horrible prison conditions. They're trying to have reform even at that time because they were so bad. Many, many prisoners would just die in the prisons. If you, had, if you did not have family and friends to bring you food, you didn't have food. What freaked me out the most <laughs> was um, the, the, the crowded conditions within the prisons. 
the dampness, no, no heating provided in the winter at all. And all they had for beds was if you had somebody gracious to you that gave you straw to throw on the floor, you'd have something to lay down on. John Bunyan lived in a condition like that. And he lived for 12 and a half years. Fortunately, he did have family and some church people that would bring him food. And, um, but the prison conditions were absolutely horrible. And, it, and he had actually described it as like the dungeon, the dark dungeon, giant despair having me as prisoner. No doubt he felt at times very much depressed and would go into some feelings of despair. But then how did he get out of the, how did, how did Christian and Hopeful and the Pilgrim's Progress, how did they get out of the dungeon? A key. They realized that all this time there was a key and that key was the key of promise. The promises of God. The promises of God. To keep looking once again to the promises of God that he fulfills his word. That's what we see in what I just read in Mark's Gospel 9, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. God has fulfilled the promise. The Messiah has come. God has rent the heavens, and he himself has come down in a, a more splendid way than we could ever imagine by himself taking, taking upon himself our humanity to identify with us fully, to live the perfectly righteous life as the new Adam so that we would have his righteousness. Going to the cross and dying the death that we deserved Dying the death of the broken covenant. Dying in our place. Then rising again triumphant that we might have life. He began a new creation. At that moment. Wow. Rend the heavens, O Lord, and come down. Lord, I thirst for you. I long for you. I faint for you. God says, I have the promise. I have fulfilled the promise. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, in Christ, people, we have a tremendous revelation of the love of God and the grace of God and the fulfillment of all the promises of God. That's what I hope we see. Because every one of us, no matter who we are, will have times of desperation, some at times more severe than others, some more severe. I'm quite sure Peter felt, not the apostle, but our friend, <laughs> Peter, as he was in the hospital about to go in to have his heart surgery, realized in a big way a, a desperate need for the Lord to be with him. Many people that I have known, and including myself, that have suffered bouts of depression, and I, for me it was in the past, thank God. And, um, but we know what desperation feels like, what heartache, people with grief. We need to look to the promise, the promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He comes up out of the water, the Spirit comes down, the Father speaks. The promise is being fulfilled. God has rent the heavens and he has come down. And as a result of that, as a result of his sacrifice, as a result of his death and his resurrection, we can now say, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus Christ has come to make all things new. John the Apostle in his first epistle says, Beloved, we are God's children. Now, now we are his children. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who, who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Do you have that hope in him that someday we know we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is? That's the promise. In Revelation 21, way toward the end, at the time of the consummation of all time, 
when Christ will rend again the heavens and come in glory, creating new heavens and a new earth wherein will dwell righteousness. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 21, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with him, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I make all things new. These words are trustworthy and true. When Jesus Christ returns, Revelation 19, 11, his second coming, he's given the name, the one who is faithful and true. We have a promise, and we can be like the psalmist. Even in our desperation, when we cry out, when shall I come? When shall I come and appear before God? I'm desperate. Rend the heavens, O God, and come down. We can be assured that God fulfills his word, his promises. Not by bypassing afflictions, for many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He'll bring us through. He will bring us through, and we will see the completion of all of his purposes and all of his promises. That's where we have to place our hope. Our hope must be placed in him fully in his all-sufficiency. When I was praying this week for Mary, I had mentioned her before. In my prayer, that's what I was directing my prayer to, is the faithfulness of his promises and his all-sufficiency to fulfill those promises. That's what we look to. That's what we look to, is Jesus Christ, the one who is faithful and true. We look to the throne of God, the one who says, I am making all things new. And then he says, these words are trustworthy and true. People, the word of God, what we have in the scriptures, these words are trustworthy and true. I'm going to close with a very short meditation by Charles Spurgeon out of the Spurgeon Bible, devotional Bible. It's based on Genesis 1, 6 to 8, where it says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came and then morning the second day. And this is what he, um, this is what the short note here says by Charles Spurgeon. Let there be an expanse. He says, note those four words, and it was so. Let there be an expanse. Note the four words, it and it was so. Whatever God ordains always comes. It is true of all his promises that whatever he has said will be fulfilled. And we will one day say of it all, and it was so. It is equally certain concerning all of his threats and what he has spoken will certainly be fulfilled. 
And the ungodly will have to say, and it was so. These words are often repeated in this chapter. They convey to us the great lesson that the word of God is sure to be followed by the deed of God. The word of God will always be followed by the deed of God. He speaks and it is done. Someday we will look back at all these wonderful promises of God of eternal life of the forgiveness of sins, of the new creation, new heavens and new earth, where there's no more death and sickness. And we will see that God is faithful and true, and we will say, and it is so. And it was so. Praise God. God is good and God is faithful. And even in the darkest hour, like Psalm 139 says, even the darkness is light to you. God will fulfill all of his promises. Isn't that good news? And it was so. Praise God. Well, we're going to...